In 1994, something happened. Punk rock had become the most popular style of music in the world. All of a sudden, the alternative was now the mainstream. The outcasts had become heroes. And what was ours was now theirs. What is punk? A common question that has been at the heart of many arguments since its inception. Who started punk? Was it the Ramones or was it the Stooges? Where did punk begin? Was it Detroit or New York City? Or did it come out of England? Who was the most punk? Was it the Sex Pistols with their snarly, anti-authoritarian attitude or was it the Clash with their socially infused lyrics? Unfortunately for you, the viewer, this film will not answer these questions nor will it delve into the frequent arguments of who is or who isn't punk. Instead, this is a story about a group of people with common interests, who at a certain period of time took punk rock out of the basements and backyard parties and to the television screens and radio airwaves across the world. This is their story, and this is how it happened. In the early 80s, America had a blossoming punk rock scene, influenced, but not a carbon copy of, the punk rock scenes of the 70s. This new scene was more of a hardcore punk and communities were popping up all over the United States. In places such as Boston, Washington DC, and Los Angeles. But by the mid 80s, the scenes had mostly imploded and most of the bands were either dismantled or experimented with other styles of music. By 1986, punk rock as it was known was considered dead. It's 10 years, the 80s when punk rock was around, it completely changed from early 80s, kind of the LA adolescence, Descendants sound to the late '80s when there was nothing good. It's it's like punk rock was really strong, like you know '80 '80 through '85, and probably like '84 it started dying away. A lot of the bands started breaking up. Um, there were no clubs really to play at. Uh, it was really there was no functioning labels. Maybe like SST, but there was nothing new really happening. You know, it was kind of a dark time for punk rock. All the other bands had either died off or, you know, you know, English Dogs, bands like Exploited, started making heavy metal records, Discharge, fucking Blitz, started making a techno record. I was disgruntled with the punk scene because it became very intolerant. Oh, come on, you know, nobody goes to the punk anymore. That's like, you know, like six years ago. But if punk rock was dead in 1986, it was about to get a healthy shot in the arm starting on New Year's Eve of that same year in the Bay Area of Northern California. Like in the 80s, the, like, uh, the whole punk thing had kind of died away. Um, and even, even I kind of had given up on it because like, our, our local scene had gotten really uh, violent and, and ugly. I mean, it was, seemed like it was getting harder and harder to go to a gig without getting in a fight or tripping over some people shooting up the speed of heroin. And, and that's, that's what it was like back in those days. Like a lot of the clubs you were playing were really like hardcore spots like CBGB's or something like that. And the gigs were getting smaller and uh, always getting shut down by the cops. So if you found a place that would do all ages shows, it would usually be like a, a veterans hall or some kind of recreation center. And usually it, it was it was owners that were not aware of what the show was going to be like. You know, they didn't realize that it, there was going to be a big, huge mess and probably a couple fights and stuff was going to get broken. So if you were lucky enough to get a hall to do the show, whoever was promoting it, it he would inevitably lose it after a show or two. But in Northern California, in, in Berkeley, they had Gilman Street. I know, things are getting tougher with In mid-86, well, we put on a show at a pizza parlor in, in Berkeley and it, it kind of everything clicked. I mean, for once, there was no violence. It was all really cool bands. 
and we spent the rest of the year developing that that warehouse. It opened on the 31st of December 1986. I'd be there before it opened to the very end, sweeping up, and I swept up every day, man. You know, always sweeping up at the street. You know? I was the garbage man. You know, I'd go in in the morning, on Monday morning, and take all the garbage down to the dump. I mean, Gilman Street was one of those places where it was run by the kids, just totally ghetto, spray paint, you know. Really, really nice example of people getting together and, and making it work. The first time we played there, I remember we uh, drew 80 people, and I got hit in the face with a basketball. First song, don't threw a basketball at my face. Good shot, too. I just started kind of getting into, you know, Starting to go there and started seeing bands like Crim Shrine, you know, Operation Ivy and uh, Isocracy. Um, and it was, it was great. Just like that, within six months after we opened, there was all these new bands and there was this whole kind of buzz. Suddenly, you know, the following year, everything just took off. Arguably one of the most influential bands to come out of the Bay Area, Operation Ivy were a direct product of the Gilman Street Club. I don't think Operation Ivy would have happened if it wasn't, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the uh, Gilman Street Club, you know what I mean? We'd always wanted to be in bands, and I mean, we were always playing together, and then, you know, we hooked up, you know, we started going to this, you know, he went to New York, and he came back and goes, there's this club down on Gilman Street that's going to open up, and I was like, Gilman Street? Like, there's nothing down there but junkyards and the day-old bread store, you know, and like, he goes, no, it's in the, that basket weaving place, I'm like, what? And, we went there, to, uh, you know, New Year's Eve in '86, and you know we saw the show, and it was like, wow, this is, this is quite something. I used to see Tim around uh, Gilman all the time. I used to call him that floppy kid because he was like sort of always bouncing around and jumping on you and kind of, you know, just sort of like he was made out of rubber or something. You know, just start doing the band thing. You know, we had this weird rehearsal place in Oakland, and we just did it. That was must have been in September of '87. And they, uh, they played right after that at Gilman, and I, I was just so amazed. Like, they were, they'd only been a band for about three months, but already everybody in the crowd knew all their songs and was singing along and jumping up on stage with them. And it was most, one of the most exciting live shows that, that I had ever seen. We did Opera Sam was a band for two years, very short. Um, look, there was no label yet on we'll Lookout. And, um, they put out the uh, 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 Corrupted Morals, Crim Shrine, Asocracy, and Operation Ivy, seven inches. I remember telling Larry, too, like, man, you ain't gonna sell these many records. Like, you're crazy. You know what I mean? Even though I didn't really properly have a record company yet, I mean, I, uh, I put out my own band's record, but I had no idea about putting out other records. But Tim came off stage and said, well, what'd you think? And I said, uh, well, I want to put out your record. Uh, you know, he thought I was, sort of thought I was joking because, like, I said they'd only been a band three or four months, but uh, he said, well, okay. And it was one of the first times I heard a band that was that good, that was my age. And it almost like, you know, you hear people saying that they got into punk because they heard it and they said, I can play this, you know what I mean? And, and Operation Ivy was the band that like, kind of like, everybody was like, whoa. Pick it up. I used to go see Operation Ivy all the time. Like they were like my favorite band. You know, these guys were like, rock stars or something you know if there was such thing as a rock star coming out of Gilman. Operation Ivy changed my life for sure. Uh, we were on tour in the US and I heard that 7 inch for the first time but it was just incredible. Next year of Scott and Punk. They were pretty much the pioneers of that sound and no one's touched them since. We got into a four-door car, 69 Newport, six-week tour, um, six weeks you know, to the East Coast. We were the first Gilman band to hit the road, and we didn't have a blue, blueprint. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Another young band that formed out of the Gilman scene would go on to completely change the way people viewed punk rock. Uh, and then we just started really getting into punk music and groups more like, uh, you know, Husker Du and The Replacements, Seven Seconds, um, Dead Kennedys. Uh, it was kind of eclectic, you know, not nothing was like considered, I wasn't like some straight up hardcore kid. I wasn't like a straight 77 punk kid. I wasn't uh, totally into maybe college rock or alternative 
music or anything like that. It was just it was kind of all of it combined. There was just different. I just had more eclectic taste than uh, just going for one thing that in, in specific. This, we got this guy in our band. His name is John, also known as Al Sobrante. We met him in, in another backyard party. He wanted to come play with us, so we started playing with him, just starting to play gigs. We started playing Davis, we started playing Gilman, just started playing these these shows. He said that there was a big party that was going on the top of this mountain. And it was put on by the drummer from the Lookout's friend, which was Trey. So there was just kind of these sort of dope smoking hippie kids that were sitting around on the floor with, you know, with candles. There was five whole kids in the audience and it, uh... Green Day played like they were like the Beatles at, at Shea Stadium. I mean, it's like, you know, Billy at 15, or 16 rather, already had this kind of just rock star persona and he kind of very shyly asked, came up and asked me, well, what did you think of our, our music? And I said, well, I want to make a record with you guys. And, and he was just like, oh, okay. And they wanted to do a record, so, you know, it was cool. It was the greatest thing in the world. I mean, they had already had, you know, Op Ivy and uh, Crim Shrine and, they were making records at that time that we absolutely loved. You know, we were, you know, some of the, as far as I'm concerned, some of the best records ever made. If Northern California was the new mecca for a do-it-yourself scene, Southern California was about to have its own resurgence. Southern California has like always been like the surf, you know, skate capital of kind of the world, you know, and it's like, it was all about, you know, hanging out on the beach, you know, surfing in the morning, uh, drinking beer, you know, all day long at the beach, skating some backyard pools, going to a punk show or a party that night, and it was kind of like the, the no, sh it was like, kind of like the no fashion punk in a way, I mean like Hollywood had its, its fashion punks and shit, but like, you know, the uniform for like a kid down here growing up was just like a pair of Levi's and a, and a t-shirt, a black flag shirt or some Converse or something. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with location. Um, you know, in New York where it's cold and rainy and you're stuck in like the barrios of Brooklyn or something, you know, it's like, these are all hardcore bands, they're all pissed off all the time because they're screaming. Southern California, we're all happy, it's like sunny and beautiful, so we're singing about chicks and shit because everywhere we go, girls in bikinis. <laughs> West Coast was political as well, but it was more of a rage, like Black Flag, and, and, the, and the scene down here was a lot of fighting, a lot of violence, a lot of gangs, like punk gangs, and just more of just a fucking chaotic mess of, of bullshit and drugs. Then up in San Francisco, you have all these, like, it's like a lot of educated people and a lot of art artists and a lot of liberal thinking and a lot of think tanks and whatever. So you have these, uh, you have a lot of punk rock bands that are more like socially aware and, and socially conscious about feminism and, and, um, and the environment, and they're like kind of hippies and whatever. Um, it's out in D.C. You have it's very political. Uh, you have all these discord bands like the Minor Threats and Fugazis of the world that are very stand for something and and want actually feel like they can change the world and try because they see it happening at in every day in their city. I mean, very few good records came out from '85 to '89. Of course, with the exception of Bad Religion Suffer. That's what invigorated our whole scene. That's what changed everything. But by then, the music scene had changed completely because it was mostly, you know, 80s metal had gotten huge. And that's all our punk friends grew their hair long and joined metal bands. And at the time we made Suffer, there was a real um, desert in the music in the punk music scene and we sort of offered a, a little bit of a revamped style of the early 80s punk and by that time Brett's skills in the studio were better and so we became more of a uh, uh, high fidelity punk band um, in 1987 when we released Suffer and I guess that was a uh, eye-opener for a lot of people. Well, Suffer was the first time I heard a band, a punk band, do three-part harmonies. I think that was kind of the start of something new. It was, it was sort of a, a, a melodic kind of thing that people hadn't really done before, hadn't done well. 
So I started Epitaph proper really in like 87. And at that time I signed L7, I signed The Little Kings, and I signed Bad Religion. Also in 87, I had just gotten clean and sober. So like when I was a kid, I was a real partier and um, uh, became pretty heavily addicted to drugs. And uh, I got clean April 14th, 1987. And uh, just right around the time that I started writing Suffer. And, uh, and right, you know, so I basically got clean and sober. I needed something to to focus on and put all my energy into, and that was it. It was the new, you know, uh, the renewed bad religion and, uh, and epitaph. In 84, uh, we were going to shows, uh, myself and Greg Kay and a couple other guys, and we tried to get into a, a social distortion show, and it was sold out. This was in, in Irvine, Orange County also. So we had nothing to do, so of course we went to somebody's house whose parents weren't home and were drinking beer in the backyard and stuff and just kind of shooting the shit and said, why don't we start our own band? Of course, none of us played instruments at all, but that didn't seem like a deterrent at the time. None of us had any really good ideas, you know? We were asking people, talking around, whatever, and uh, ended up uh, just picking The Offspring because we kind of just didn't dislike it too much. <laughs> it was like the best the best thing. It wasn't like we were all stoked, like, oh, this is the perfect name. It's like, oh, I can live with that. There was also a healthy dose of rivalry, and not just between the East and West Coasts, but rather between the Northern and Southern California scenes. In the 90s, when we started getting into it, um, when Pennywise was around and no effects and everybody, uh, there was an East Coast, West Coast rivalry thing, you know, was sick of it all and, and all the bands from back there and Agnostic Front and there was like, there was always this uh, East Coast versus West Coast thing. But then when, when everyone eventually got together, then everyone was super cool. The rivalry, I think, it, it, there was uh, Huntington Beach and Hollywood punks didn't get along. It was just, you know, part of the whole thing. It was just supposed to be dangerous and supposed to be, you know, fucked up. So there had to be some kind of tension along the way that, to make it punk rock, or else it just wouldn't be punk rock. Well, we, you know, they were always behind us. Hmm. It's just, I mean, like, punk rock started in L.A., and it would, would trickle up to San Francisco, but they were always three years behind us. And you can ask anyone from L.A. Don't ask anyone from San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. No, but seriously, we would we would be doing shows in L.A. and the kids would have like the style and the and the like the dances and the sound right. The, that early you know that early you know California hardcore sound, and then we'd go play shows in San Francisco and there would be dudes up there wearing leopard skin tights and Devo glasses with long afros. I mean like, and that was and a skinny tie and that was punk to them and we'd, we were like what the fuck. You know, seriously, they were lame. I don't care. You know, I mean, they did have the Dead Kennedys. That's their one claim to fame. San Francisco was every bit as new wave as L.A. when it came to like the you know the art school kids. But when when it came to hardcore punk rock, they were like three years behind. Three years back then was a lot. But the truth is that uh, the tension that exists in in general uh, among the population maybe played a little bit of a role in the competition. And for us leaving the East Bay, I mean, it sounds weird now, but it was a bit of a coup, right? The Upper Shinobi guys going to Epitaph Records. No Northern Cal. We were actually the first non-Southern California band on the, in this label. Uh, Brett goes, hey, I love your tape, man. It's, am it's amazing. It's, it's cassette tape. I love it. But one thing's going to change. And I was like, what's that? I said, the name. I the name. I said, the name. Yeah, man. Rancid, man. You gotta come up with a better name than that. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, well, I don't really know Brad that well, but I'm arguing with him. I'm like, what do you mean? Goes, What's his name? Rancid. What kind of name is that? I go, that's a punk rock name, man. I go, look, listen to me. We ain't from Orange County or like LA. We're East Bay, bro. I play with Neurosis, man. We play with Grinch. You play with Wimple and fucking, you know what I mean? Like, I ain't gonna have no like happy name. Like, I don't even know what I was talking about. I love LA hardcore, man.
but because I believe in it so much, you know what I mean? In my name. He did, I think. And I always bring that up to him too. Whenever he doubts me about something, I go, man, I don't know, Brad, you didn't even like my band name. Oh yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> At the end of the 80s, the California punk scene had re-emerged as a self-sufficient entity that didn't rely on commercial television, radio, or major label distribution. Its strong focus on DIY ethics and a camaraderie between the bands made it possible for them to tour full-time and make a living. There used to be this book um, that Maximum Rock and Roll put out. I don't know if they even do it anymore, but it was called Book Your Own Fucking Life. And it was a great thing for bands uh, in the early 90s. I'm, I'm sure it was for a long time before I heard. It was really great for us because it was just, they just publicized it once a year and it had all new contacts for people that were doing punk shows. And so you could call somebody in some tiny town in Utah or something, you know, and find a place to play. And, uh, and a lot of times they were parties, you know, but, but you could be on tour and maybe make gas money at least find a place to sleep. Yeah, we just played basement parties and we played, uh, kids would rent out um, vets halls and, you know, wherever, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and, uh, and we would end up playing um, pretty much wherever, whenever, you know, and, um, and none of it was, there was no clubs. I think we maybe played one or two clubs. We played one club in Portland, a place called the Satyricon, and we were all underage, so, um, we had, me and Mike had to stand outside before we played and then, and then they told us to come in to play and then they said, okay, now leave and well, they paid us, you know, 20 bucks or something. And we had our ribbed album out and we just did a tour and I made $1,500 when I got home from the tour and I thought, I can, I can live off this. In 91, I made $8,000 that year, and that was great. That was amazing to make $8,000 in a year playing punk rock. So that's when I thought, as long as my wife has a good job, I can do this for a while longer. Another factor was the correlation between punk rock and the lifestyle that revolved around surfing, skating, and snowboarding. The surfing and skating were always, you were always considered like a pothead or a loser or a dropout if you were doing that shit. So punk rock fit in naturally with that, you know? Well, you don't know I grew up as a skateboarder because I wasn't an athlete, you know? Now people are saying you are an athlete if you're a skateboarder, which is totally true, but back in the day, I grew up as a skateboarder because I was a punker, you know? And we, it's a way for me to ride around and go get into trouble and get the fuck out of there, you know? Rasher Magazine, you know, always had that connection, you know? Uh, always made the connection, you know what I mean? You always saw bands like JFA, you know, and then you had the whole skate punk and the skate rock compilations and shit. I mean, The Faction, you know, was a band that I grew up with. One of the first shows I was ever at was at The Faction show. But they're a huge influence on getting into transitioning from the skateboard thing to the music because they kind of, here at least, they kind of started that whole thing. And to me, it, seem, it seems like they started the whole thing worldwide. <laughs> Because there's a lot of um, sort of ideas, I think, punk rock and, and skateboarding or surfing, and they've all, it, it's always been, you know, it's the same kind of people. It's the same mentality. I mean, skateboarding and surfing all, you know, pretty much Southern California is, you know, <laughs> this is where it all kind of started. A lot of it, but mostly on the skating side. The surfing side was more like hippie shit, you know, people listening to Led Zeppelin and Bob Marley and, and, and kind of more folk music and, you know, long-haired, weed-smoking dudes. Like, uh, it wasn't, <coughs> punk rock wasn't really accepted in the commu surfing community. I used to have, like, black flag bar spray painted on my board and a skinhead out in the water and people would want to beat me up because, you know, get the fuck out of here, tennis ball head or whatever, or whatever. But, uh, 
we had, we we were connected with like uh, a local surf shop in Hermosa called Spiderboards, and um, you know through some people there and whatever. There's a guy named Taylor Steele that that started making surf movies, and there was this whole young breed of of surfers coming up. Kelly Slater, Kalani Rob, Rob Machado, these guys that were super aggro, super ripping, and doing stuff that no one had ever done before on a surfboard. And he put out a video, and he wanted to use you know Pennywise as the soundtrack and a, and a couple other bands and you know Bad Religion didn't surf and Down By Law didn't surf we, we grew up at the beach so we were like I don't know if those some of those bands said no but we wound up being like the main one of the main bands on one of his first movies called Momentum and that movie went worldwide and it kind of set the bar for this new level of surfing and along with it came this punk rock soundtrack which had never been heard You guys got guys got you got Kelly Slater like ripping away to shreds and blasting airs and and you got fast punk rock music behind it and you just looked at it and go wow this is it this is right so then it you know went into into the skateboarding stuff because they're aggressive sports and, and aggressive soundtrack fits. Um, when I was in my early teens, I uh, studied surf videos, watching Kelly and Rob and Shane and all those guys and. Um, I just I studied it, so it kind of just got in my mind, and I was like, "That's the, f the feeling of studying those guys, and then um, stretching before I go surf." It was like getting me amped to go surf, and so uh, it definitely made a huge impact. I remember too when I first started doing the um, WQS and contest, I'd listen to punk rock music and all that stuff, and and uh, I'd actually get too psyched and too amped. I'd go out there and just spaz and like fall off, and I'd be like, "Relax," I'm like. I'm ready to go, you know. We well, gotta imagine if you're gonna drop in on a wave and you might die or a shark is gonna eat you, you wanna hear something that's fast and motivating. Uh, and same thing with skateboarding, but the, you gotta understand also too that the, the genesis of skateboarding and surfing were here in California. And the people that did it were complete derelicts that, were, that didn't have jobs and were dropouts out of school, you know, so like, um, so the music they listen to and the life they lead is something that, you know, it's like, it's all the same. So the music ha it has to be just as, just as full of some kind of personal anarchy as anything else. And I don't think punk rock music chose its athletes, its athletics or whatever, or, or, the, or these athletes chose this music. I think they kind of chose each other. And then, really, I think, I got a credit to, to Fletcher and Pennywise. He, I think, convinced Epitaph to submit the Pennywise stuff for some of the surf movies that were coming out. I think that was the first Momentum movie. I'm not sure. It was, there was a few of them. And I, I, that instantly, there was this whole new audience. I wouldn't say that we were responsible for it. I would say that, that Taylor Steele is responsible for it. I mean, I give him all the credit because he's the one who decided to put that music into his into his video. and. And it opened the door. Taylor Steele uh, is a surf video photographer that he's made on uh, momentum, focus, uh, good times, all these great, you know, historical surf films. He's the one that founded, like, you know, brought Kelly Slater and Benji Weatherly into the world, you know, Rob Machado. Before, before Taylor Steele came along, the surf videos, you know, just had rock or whatever, and they had all kinds of different forms of music in it. And Taylor Steele really focused in on Southern California punk rock, putting on Offspring, Blink, Us, Pennywise. In these videos. When this happened, it was a cultural phenomenon. It was a huge hit surfing video. It was like really the, f the one that kind of started everybody making surf and skate videos. And then I just got it out there that anyone who's making a skate video, if they wanted music, you know, major labels will charge you a bunch of money, but I'll give you music for free. It, it's a big way that I, that I, that, that a lot of my bands got popular because kids in Kansas would buy a skate video to see this, you know, so the latest skate tricks, and then they would hear you no know, effects, and they go, well, what's that, you know what I mean? I mean, it was definitely the soundtrack to all those videos, you know? It happened for us, because the very next crop of movies, we were on with Ignition and stuff, and and you could just, you could see it within a few months that we had a whole different audience, a whole new audience, in in addition to the, the regular punker kids, more of the surf and skate guys. This single relationship between this culture and the music was enough to take these bands overseas. I met Taylor one day, he was videoing down to Mission Beach, and I knew it was him because the surfers out there were ten times better than anyone who surfed there normally. And uh, I ran out to him and I'm like, hey, are you Taylor Steele? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm Rick DeVoe. And I 
promote concerts and I'm like I want to take my bands and mix them with your videos and let's tour around the world so we can go surfing and he's like all right and so I got hold of the offspring and we did the offspring and it was really bitching and then we did Pennywise and then we did you know we just started doing them all over the place DeVoe was great because he he was the guy in, in San Diego that was so pumped on all the Epitaph stuff and this would be back in 92, 93 and stuff. And he was putting on shows there and he was really combining it with the surf thing and he got it going. When there was no radio to support, you know, punk rock, which was that time period, and there was no MTV support for punk rock, something like a kid getting a surf video in Australia. I mean, we all know that Australia is a huge, I mean, everything revolves around the water there and, and surfing. and. I remember Taylor Steele's video over there, you know, was one of the main things that brought, like all of a sudden we were popular in Australia. We had no idea. It, it kind of hit in certain places that where like surfing was big. So Australia got it, Hawaii got it, Florida got it, California got it, Japan got it. And so when that happened, it kind of fused everything and made it possible for bands like us and Pennywise and Offspring to actually go out and, and sell tickets and sell records. It wasn't because of radio, it wasn't because of MTV. It wasn't because of anything except that video. People started buying the records, and we went over there not knowing what to expect, and we, we played a show in Sydney, I remember, at a festival, we were standing there, and there wasn't one person there, and that band live was playing at the other stage against us, and we were sitting there going, well, this, this is fucking bullshit, you know? Everyone's going to go see live. They were like one of the biggest bands in the world, and 10 minutes later, there was 10,000 people on our stage going fucking crazy, and we're like, what the fuck? We had no idea, and, you know, it was all because of Taylor Steele's video. That's what I think. While the punk rock scene was reestablishing itself, all of the industry and media attention was focused on a music scene coming out of the Northwest, which they labeled grunge. Sub pop records seemed to be at the center of this explosion, boasting releases from bands such as Soundgarden, Mudhoney, and Nirvana. Some of these bands remained independent while others chose to sign with a major label. Even though this alternative scene was hip and promising, it had not yet had a real breakthrough genre-defining hit, but this was all about to change. On January 11th, 1992, Nirvana's Nevermind became the number one album on the U.S. Billboard chart, knocking off Michael Jackson's Dangerous. And this alone would change the face of music forever. There was never really an idea that we were going to make it as a band. It just—it was impossible because they're just those kinds of bands were not on the radio, they weren't MTV, they weren't making it. So the first thing that even started to change that really has got to be Nirvana and Teen Spirit. Nirvana was, it was a punk band, you know? There's no denying that. And when those guys broke broke down that barrier and that, that, that door, kicked the fucking door in with Smells Like Teen Spirit, we were like, just going, fuck yeah, like, now what? I, I, well now, and then I look back in retrospect, if it hadn't been for Nirvana, I don't think bands like Rancid would have ever had an opportunity, or Green Day, or The Offspring, or whoever. Because I mean, that, that was huge, it was on MTV, and to me when I saw that video, it's like, well yeah, that's what a show kind of looks like, you know, they had all the kids jumping around and stage diving and stuff, and that's what Gilman Street looked like, and it was like, wow, this is actually pretty cool that this kind of stuff is being, being seen by a bigger audience. And that was the real break. I don't think it was Green Day Offspring that was the real break for us, it was Nirvana. That was the first time really cool alternative band got big and it was pretty exciting it was just like it was like boom get out of the way here comes the real deal here comes the guys in, in a final shirt and a fucking pair of Levi's that are just playing music and they're not trying to be anybody they're just trying to get their art across they're not trying to be rock stars yeah. Yeah. when I came on the map they changed radio got all the hair metal bands off the radio and brought punk rock to the forefront even though they weren't totally punk rock, but they were they were they were a punk band, but just a kind of a different s style of it. Even though people call them grunge, you know. Um, so they brought back stripped down, raw, real music to the radio. Like punk rock was pretty much anti metal, you know, anti anti rock and roll, anti all that shit. It was no fucking makeup and I mean, well, there was makeup granted, but I mean, it wasn't like you know looking. It was it was anti looking like a girl and fucking hairspray and all that shit. So. It was kind of funny to see the effect that Nirvana had on all the, the bad hair metal bands. For my generation, everyone remembers the first time they heard uh, Nevermind. 
And the first time he heard Teen Spirit. Actually, Joey from, from Lagwagon. He played it for me the first time. I don't know, it's something you remember. I don't know if you guys are old enough, but that was the song that changed everybody in our scene. Because everything kind of happened in cycles, and if you think about it, like, when the punk with the pistols and the clash and shit, Iggy and the Stooges, MC5, you know, it was, it was kind of David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. It was kind of New York Dolls. It was going that way, you know what I mean? So it was just a matter of time. Um, I don't really feel like there was a separate... The, there's really a separation between grunge and punk rock. Like I said, I think that there's there's very similar energies in both. I feel like there's very similar ethos in both. There's an honesty uh, in all that music, and I don't feel like I don't really feel like there was one scene versus another scene. I feel like they kind of like were this big mass together. I mean, you also got to remember this is when you know the whole music industry seemed like it was willing to take a little couple more chances. You know what I mean? Because as much as people want to think it's all evil and corporate and shit like that, yeah, everything's evil and corporate. Whether it's the chair you sit on or the food that you put in your mouth, man. There's no way to escape it unless you're na naked levitating in a forest. You know what I mean? And then you're a fucking hippie and then you should be shot anyway. Yeah, yes, but you know what else was happening? Look at the guitar sales in the 90s. Fender and Gibson, those companies went through the roof as well. So, I mean, you've got a lot of different things maybe adding up. I think it was kind of just one step at a time. First it was Nirvana, and then once kids got into that, then it was easy to get into Smashing Pumpkins, and then maybe they got into Rollins or whatever. It just got, you know, little by little, a little bit more aggressive. And bands like us and our friends were just a few steps away. Although the grunge and punk scenes were not aligned, the fact that distorted guitars were now ruling the airwaves sent the major labels on the hunt for the next big thing. We didn't get our uh, deal with Atlantic until 1993. So, and then 94 was a very big year. Ew, this guy, a supreme number one weenie head. So, will you quit the band soon? I'm firing everybody and starting Bad Religion Mark II. What's your comment on this? I want to borrow you for a second. It wasn't really until then that we even had a, a chance, but from the very early days, we thought it'd be great to be on a real label. You know, Epitaph wasn't, until the, the early 90s, Epitaph was still just run out of Brett's garage, basically. And so, when we were kids, it was our dream to be on a big label. Bad Religion was a good, solid build. They, were, they, got, they got popular. They started drawing, it just started happening for them fast, and you know, they made very smart records. Green Day, um, you know, I started working with them. You know, they had just they had their their second record out on Lookout. You know, you know, punk coming out is like 1992, and we were just everywhere we played. There was a, like you know, a lot of people in the clubs, and um, even if there, there was even if it was a small show, there was a sense of enthusiasm that was happening. That we um, we were just having a great time, and you know, we brought our own silk screen T-shirt. You know, making t-shirts on people's front lawns and stuff like that, you know. So just basically as I'm finishing mixing an album for Jeff and Elliot, they get Green Day. They put a, a four song demo, and one of the songs was Basket Case. I don't think Longview was on there, she was on there, and it was a cassette. As I was mixing one night, it was like 12 at night, they put the cassette on, they go, Rob, you gotta listen to this, we think this is great. So of course, I'm thinking, Ugh. The last thing I want to do is do some a &R. I've been, been working with the Muffs for four months every night, you know, it's, it's late. But I put the cassette in on my way home and I hear this music come out and I was just like, I gotta sign these guys. It took me like two seconds. I don't know, we just kind of talked to Rob and we ended up really liking him. He had a strong opinion of music. I think we were really impressed with that, you know, he was just a huge Beatles fan and uh, he played guitar and he was a producer. He really wanted to um, put, out, put out a record. And 
I just think when it came down to it, he was the guy that sort of made the most sense. He just because it was kind of like he was a musician and he had and he knew what the mentality of, of a musician was. It seemed that everything up to this point had been brewing slowly and organically, but no one had any idea what was about to happen next. I honestly think, you know, Kurt Cobain killing himself and uh and Nirvana going away created a vacuum for like catchy, aggressive music. When uh, Dookie st started getting played on the radio, I thought, "Wow, here we go! Like this is this is it." I mean, Nirvana was one thing, but Green Day was you know pretty much a straight up punk rock band. Green Day did to grunge is what Nirvana did to to hair rock. Like I mean, when Green Day came, grunge was done. You know, so in essence, you know, Billy Joe killed grunge. You know, I was going to college and I was working actually at a record store. And, um, you know, there's people that had no idea about the punk rock scene at all. And all of a sudden they were asking me about Green Day and they were asking me, like, people that I went to college with were asking about these punk rock bands. So I was like, how did you hear about this band? And they were like, oh, you know, I saw the video on MTV or I, see, you know, I started hearing them on the radio. Like, what's this all about? And it really kind of took me by surprise that these bands that I thought of as, like, underground punk rock bands was starting to get picked up on by people that would never normally listen to that kind of music. So it was really starting to tip at that point and, and spill into mainstream culture. For the punk rock scene, I think yeah. they were the best of the time, for sure, you know. Um, and the timing was impeccable, because no one's ever heard power pop like that before, you know. And, uh, you know, I, power pop, it's such a, I, I love that term, and I don't know who else might categorize Green Day as that, but I, I think Blink and, and Green Day and a few others kind of come from the same, you know, they both speak to the same audience. A white suburban kid whose life isn't that bad, but it's not that good, you know. I remember hearing Longview on the radio the first time and just like that, that opening riff and just being like, holy shit, what is this? I remember, um, when Mike wrote the bass line to it, he was on acid. <laughs> so, and he was like sitting on the floor and kind of, you know, oh, just check this out, you know, and it's like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. And then, uh, but thank God he, he remembered it. And uh, it, then we uh, just kind of started piecing it together, you know, playing it in different spots. But I think the first time we ever really played that song was in Longview, Washington. And that's why we got called. Really, it just took months, it just grinded. It took a few months, like four months. After two months, K-Rock started playing it a little bit. They played at night, and then it just grew and grew. And after six months, Longview basically made Dookie go gold. But it took all that time. But what was really happening was, is a new sound was emerging. TV got it. It was a three-piece. The video was shot really kind of ghetto. When that hit, they just poured the gasoline on it and it just exploded. And that was, uh, you know, that was pretty much history. That was it. Punk rock was now official, and it was on the map. A spin magazine down, and Green Day was on the cover, and I was like, yes, you know, I was like, yes, finally. Next thing you know, I mean, Spin magazine put on the cover in 1994, the year punk broke, you know. So the whole music climate changed. It wasn't just for Epitaph. All of a sudden, punk rock was on the radio just unheard of when I was growing up. It was going to happen eventually. It, it had to happen. It was either going to be Green Day or Bad Religion. The Offspring, no one thought they were going to get big. <laughs> I was totally out of left field. Yeah, I, I had a feeling about it. Yeah? Yeah. I should clarify, though, I've had that feeling on record subsequently, and it never came true. <laughs> I remember getting that. And when I first got the, the finished mixes and I was driving home from work and I was listening to them in my car, which at the time was like a, you know, like a 1978 beige Volvo station wagon. And I'm driving home and I'm cranking this, this CD, uh, no, uh, cassette tape. <laughs> and, uh, and I was already into my home neighborhood and I just started circling the house. I didn't want to go in because I, I listened to self-esteem over and over. I listened to it like 11 times. And I just kept circling the block because I didn't want to stop listening to it. Or I didn't want to look like a weirdo sitting in my car. But, um, and then I went in and I said to my wife, um, and this might sound really vulgar, but I said, honey, 
I think we're going to be rich. <laughs> I'm separated. Hey! We were listening. We were on tour. The Offspring was opening with us. They were in a, in a Holiday Inn school bus that the drummer, Ron, had converted. Like, made a bunch of bunks and shit. And, you know, we're, we're in a van. We got six guys in a van with no trailer, all of our equipment and all of our fucking merchandise and six guys. And we're touring the entire United States. Um, and we're listening to Smash, you know, on the, on the CD Walkman. And Brian's like, yeah, Brett thinks this, like, this is a radio song. It's a radio hit. And he's playing, like, he's playing Keep It Separated. And I'm going, what do you mean radio hit? And he's like... Thinks that this song is gonna be like they're gonna play it on the radio or something. I'm like, really? Well, no fucking way. They're not gonna play this. And he's like, I don't know. That's what he seems to think. Like it's a hit song. I'm like, yeah, whatever. He's all, yeah. I told him the same thing. Well, yeah, fuck yeah. Twelve million albums later, it was a hit song. There was a lot organic about the Offspring's record happening. Yeah, keep them separated. Keep them separated. You know, there was just it was a well-written song. They. They write great songs. It was almost instantaneous. I mean, their previous record had sold 50,000. So, um, you know, the song Come Out and Play got on the radio. K-Rock in L.A. grabbed it right away, put it on, um, uh, and uh, they blew it up in our, in our local market. And then the next thing you know, I mean, K-Rock's a very influential station, always has been. And so other stations said, hey, what's this tune? You know, and they all started playing it. You know, and the next thing you know, marching bands are playing it at baseball games and basketball games, and and you know, it's in the you know, it was it was almost everywhere. They were playing "Keep Them Separated" over the, the the radio, and I was eating lunch or something, and I saw the people and the cooks in the kitchen doing this sort of like Egyptian dance. <laughs> We were so happy for Brian and, and all the guys in the Offspring because it was like one of us hit it big, you know. Um, I know Brett was, Gurowitz at the time was really, you know, they saw what was happening with Green Day, so there was like, come on, there's, you got a couple moves you can make to be one of the two or three original bands, you know, there's only a few slots, like, to get in as one of the originals, you know, and, you know, Brian Holland was a great songwriter, and he wrote that song, man, and that video they made, I think they only made it for like 5,000 bucks, it's so, you know, it's, it's, it was really cool that they did that and helped all of us out. I think probably when I knew something was really going on is when, because I lived in a tiny apartment at the time, and I'd gotten up and I was in like my underwear and I was in my kitchen like getting a glass of water out of the kitchen sink, and in the apartment complex you can see through the kitchen window to the doors of the people on the other side, and there's a guy on his cordless phone standing on his porch, and he goes, yeah, man, I'm looking at him right now. <laughs> uh, because when that blew up, really what happened is the sound blew up, not just the offspring. It was shortly after that, um, the Rancid record went platinum and blew up, and, and Ruby Soho and Time Bomb were on the radio. It was around that time that I quit my band um, after writing a record for my band that went gold. So, was, you know, one day punk rock is this cool underground thing that I'm doing and working very hard on and nurturing and developing and then it just popped. I call it the democratization of punk when punk left the urban center and you could now find it in the malls throughout America, throughout the world. And when I saw Rancid on MTV for the first time, I said, this is so rad. That's all, that's all I thought is, this is so rad. If the world came around to me, what I was doing, I'm minding my own business, they came to me. You know what I mean? I had to go, you know, 
Well, you know, it was just a crazy time because, I mean, everybody thinks that, you know, they have some preconceived idea that there's so much money going around that, you know, you know, all of a sudden, like, because you're maybe on TV or you, you're doing this or you're doing that or you got this kind of record or whatever, that you got, your, li your pockets are lined with fucking dough now, all of a sudden. It's like, well, if that's the case, why is my man out in the street? Cou crou couch surfing. You know what I mean? I mean, fucking top ramen. You know what I mean? If this is the glamorous lifestyle of rock and roll, where's my fucking. I, give me some real spaghetti, man. I actually thought that they were all successes, whether they sold or not, uh, just because I thought that the music was so cool. But, uh, I mean, face it, you know, Punk and Drublick sold a half million records. So, uh, if you want to monitor it as a success in that way, that would probably have been the biggest record. Well, yeah, we got No Effects got a gold record, but it, I think it took us eight to ten years before it went gold. Oh, yeah? It never hit the charts. Punk and Drublick, I don't think it ever sold more than 2,000 records a week, but it did 500,000 in the U.S. eventually. You know, bands like Bad Religion and No Effects started raising the bar and writing really good songs. You know, I kind of noticed that uh, the scene had totally changed. I saw a grown man walk into a bar with a No Effects hoodie, and I, I knew No Effects from forever. I knew Fat Mike from summer camp. Probably when Basket Case came out, I think, um, you know, towards the end of that, I, that, that single, I think it was like things were, um, you know, it was like Woodstock and Lollapalooza and, you know, uh, mud fighting and all that shit. It was like, well, this has definitely gone haywire, you know. But it wasn't just the bands that were experiencing this unprecedented level of success. The indie labels, most of which were run by the bands themselves, were also reaping the benefits of punk rock's newfound popularity. It is interesting how so many label owners in punk rock are or were in bands. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it, gives, it gave me a really good perspective. Because I, I, I know what I wanted being in a band, so... I could uh, figure out what to give a band or how to make them happy or how to make them feel comfortable. Because I just told them things that I would want to hear or just honest with them. I know working with Mike is always really cool for us because he, you know, he had a first-hand idea. You know, he had experience with what we were dealing with, you know. And he, knew, he was doing it at the same time, so. Lagwagon, Carpagandi, No Use for Name, all sold the same amount of records, pretty close. They each got in between two and 300,000 within a few years. Lagwagon, No Use, Carpagandi, uh, Face to Face, they were all around the 200,000 mark. And then uh, our next record, Electric and Carney, was kind of ridiculous. It was more or less like an overnight thing. And it was the first album on Fat to Sell um, 100,000 records. Epitaph had a huge part to do with it, was that, they, you know, they were really, I mean, if you think about that label, you know, here's a guy that's like, you know, probably selling records out of his apartment, and he ends up, you know, making some of the most definitive punk rock in history, you know, that were coming out of, at, you know, with, with like Bad Religion, Rancid, No Effects, Pennywise, and Offspring. I mean, shit, that's five fucking huge bands, you know, and, um, and then there's us. <laughs> well, I mean, it changed everything. It, it put us on the map, for one thing. We outgrew our little space. We had records, we had offspring records piled up to the ceiling. Epitaph Records was just a total uh, breeding ground for, like, creativity. You know, punk rock, like, just playground. It was like you, you had this father figure, Brett, you know, Gerowitz, in a way, who was in one of the greatest punk bands of all time, Bad Religion. And he's kind of saying, yeah, here, you know, I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to do that for you, I'm going to put your records out and do whatever you want. Fuck yeah, that's radical, that's punk, that's cool, do this. And you're just going, wow. It, it just had a really good vibe of, like, positivity, family vibe, all the bands supporting each other, bands on Epitaph touring together, um, recording together, and just never, you know, it, it was like, Everything went beyond everyone's expectations, you know. No one was expecting someone to sell 100,000 records, let alone 12 million records. So 
it just kept getting bigger and bigger and it just got you know like better and better and everyone was like fuck yeah we're doing you know we're doing something we built this from the ground up and and felt like we were part of something really special i always thought it'd be cool to have a label um you know, I certainly didn't invent the idea. I mean, everyone from, you know, Ian had Discord, uh, Biafra had Alternative Tentacles. Of course, Brett had uh, Epitaph and Fat Mike had Fat already by the time I decided to start. I never had the means to start one, but I always thought it would be cool to be able to, to shout out like, hey, look at all these other cool bands that you guys should be listening to. That was a big part of the fun of having the labels, signing bands that I knew were great that people hadn't heard yet, like whether it was AFI or TSOL or or the gutter mouth or whatever. Uh, Dexter Holland proposed that we would, uh, we should all quit our jobs and tour full time. Because we had signed to Nitro Records, his label, in about 1994. You Punk Rock's skyrocketing popularity in record sales, it seemed as though everybody was trying to get onto the bandwagon. Whether it meant dyeing their hair blue or trying to sign the next Green Day. You know, Madonna was coming around, you know, all these fucking people, you know, people from this record label and that record, don't even know our fucking names. You know what I mean? Just like, yeah, can I speak with um, Jim Fredrickson? How does my name sound like fucking Jim, dude? It's Lars, you fucking prick. Next, you know what I mean? So it, it was it was crazy because you know all of a sudden everybody's paying attention. We handled it well, I think. In the mid '90s, we really could have signed to any record deal we wanted to, to any label. But we met with one. We met with Hollywood Records, and the meeting was so distasteful that we never wanted to have another major label meeting again. And basically, we just kept asking the guy, what can you do for us that Epitaph can't, what we can't do for ourselves? And he really had no answer. Uh, I mean, major. I don't know if major labels were trying to poach my bands, but I got numerous offers from my label. You know, I mean, I've turned down $50 million offers more than once. Yeah, I got an offer to sell Fat Records, but I, you know, I didn't want to sell it. You mainly, you know, major labels would come to you and go, oh, congratulations, I want to sign one of your bands. And that was not you know, the business model. You know, the business model was absolutely not. Keep everything and keep the bands. If you can sell, you know, 200,000 CDs on a punk label, that's a great living for the band. But all of this came with a price. Had the DIY ethics of punk rock been compromised to reach this level of success? With the term sellout being thrown around heavily, the backlash was really starting to heat up. You know, it was like back then, you know, the offspring were the good guys for, or, or uh, the offspring were the good guys for having a platinum record on an indie, and Green Day, where everyone was like mad at Green Day, you know. But and whereas the offspring and Rancid were cool because they had platinum records on Epitaph. And back then there was a real division in what people thought was right and acceptable within the punk rock community, the punk rock ethos of doing things on your own. Do you do it yourself? Do you stick with an indie? Do you sign with a major? Do you take your shot? Do you not? Um, and I mean, it really divided things. There was a huge argument for years and years in the punk rock community of, you know, who's a sellout, who's not a sellout. Oh, this band signed to a major. Oh, you're a sellout. Oh, you're on an indie. Okay, you're still cool. There was that whole struggling mentality in the scene, definitely. We didn't want to be on an indie major. <laughs> you know, we didn't want to. You know, we were on Lookout. We loved Lookout. That was, to us, for us, I mean, Lookout was the ultimate independent label. We ended up taking control of it ourselves. We can, took control of like our own destiny. So. You know, so for us to sort of to make a leap to a different indie just didn't make any sense. When Green Day hit the airwaves and it blew up, you know, there was a huge backlash. Like all the, I mean, they were banned from Gil Gilman Street. They were banned from fucking, you know, the whole Bay Area was pretty anti-Green Day, right? I don't know how bummed Green Day was. You know, it's 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 a catch twenty two. I know they were bummed because that was their hometown and that was like, you know, their their whole deal. But at the same time, they were making millions of dollars. So, you know, where, where do you draw the line? 
I think that mentality is definitely necessary, though. I mean, for you know, a, a club like like Gilman to to say to close their doors to certain people. Did you get like a memo or anything? <laughs> <laughs> nah, you know what? When we signed to a major label, we knew we weren't ever going to play there again. Yeah. We knew it. You know, it, it was there was no memo. We knew the deal, and we did it anyway. Apparently, there's a list now at Gilman Street of bands that are banned from there, and we're on the list. But no one ever called me and told me we were banned, and we've never done anything against them, and we've never been on a major label or MTV or commercial radio really. So I'm not sure why we're banned from there. We put out our own records. We're probably the biggest DIY band in the world, but I think they just want to ban us because uh, we're fun to ban. Well, yeah, we received a lot of backlash, but I wouldn't say from fans. I'd say from what we call the punk police and people who talk about the rules of punk and how this is punk, but that is not. Those are, to me, some of the most uh, uninteresting people to hang around and those are the ones who did most of the criticizing. You can't please everybody but but I never the backlash never bothered me because you know we're doing the same thing we're still on Epitaph Records we stayed indie you know doing what we want to do playing the music that I love the backlash never affected me man it, it never did I walk down any street go to any show do what the fuck I want to do ready when people say shit to my face that was rare, that was, and very, no one ever say shit to me, man. You know what I mean? What are they gonna say? Your song's on the radio. Yeah, that's me. That's what I, that's my music. I love my band, that's what my brothers, this is what I do. Nah, I never gave a fuck. Like this, I remember this guy comes up to us one time at a Blink show and he's like, you guys are fucking awesome, you're amazing. Oh my God, you know, what label are you on this and that? You know, I go through this whole speech of how we were on an independent, but, we, we couldn't get paid, and we couldn't find our records anywhere. They couldn't keep up with getting our records in stores, so we had to move to a major label. And so now we're on MCA, and the guy goes, oh, well, I run Gilman Street, and turns his back and walk away. And we, were, we started laughing, we're like, fuck Gilman Street. It's like, it's like throw up, you know? Like, and we thought, it was, like, we, we thought it was the funniest shit. We never, we'd never played Gilman Street. Um, I know that like you had to submit your lyrics. I think we were going to play that at one point and they asked us to submit our lyrics and then they read what our lyrics were and they said, you know what, I think we're cool, thanks. When we were down in Southern California at this uh, festival. <laughs> Fat Mike was there and um, there was also a guy there from MTV, uh, like a program director. And I was talking with him and Mike, and they're talking about the Soulmate video. And uh, then when I, when I left, or he might have pulled Mike aside, and he told Mike, Mike later told me that he told him that um, we really want the No Effects video, um, and if you don't give it to us, we're gonna pull the No Use for a Name video. So Mike basically just told him to F off, you know? And um, so our video got pulled. <laughs> yeah, but MTV, yeah, the Soulmate, MTV pretty much stopped playing that video because we wouldn't give him our video. Punk Rock's success in 1994 also led to the formation of a small tour that would take the DIY ethos, punk rock camaraderie, and so-called extreme sports from California and take it all over the United States. The Warp Tour, as it was named by founder Kevin Lyman, would go on to become the longest running traveling festival in U.S. history. So I gotta put something, I gotta put something together where for one last summer, where we take a skateboard ramp, we get some friends together, go around the country, and, and, and it was gonna to try to get bands to support each other. Um, at that point, there were so many bands touring around. And started calling a few bands that I knew. I got guys like Steve Salba, uh, skaters to kind of organize a few skaters, Neil Hendricks, Mike Frazier. We built a, uh, had brought a ramp that was Masonite. Masonite doesn't really work in the rain and it rains a lot in other parts of the summer country during the summertime, not Southern California, something I learned. And uh, we, uh, God, it was, we just got Sublime, we got No Use for a Name, L7, Quicksand, Civ, Orange 9 Millimeter. Uh, it's funny, No Doubt played on that first year for part of the tour. 
and we all loaded up, kind of shot off into kind of see if we could pull something together. We had no idea. We had to share buses. Uh, it's so funny now when I have this tour, there's bands bringing two buses, uh, the levels, and, and back then it was uh, strange combinations of people, L7 and no use for names, sharing a bus. Uh, those girls were tough back then. We had uh, orange 9mm and subline. Nothing like putting a bunch of drunks and vegans together, straight edge vegans together. We did the first Warped Tour actually, and um, it was a lot different than it is now. It was, the attendance wasn't, you know, nearly as, as good, and, but it, it, it was just cool to be a part of because it was the first time that, that um, there was a summer tour for punk bands that's, that punk bands could go on to. Kevin Lyman, the star of the Warp Tour, was uh, just this, he's amazing and he's, he's more down for the scene and more responsible for the punk rock scene, I think, than most bands, you know, and so he has this grand idea, you know, where the Warp Tour go to Australia and everyone sleeps in tents, we all travel around like brothers, but I gotta hand it to Kevin, he, he really created, you know, something monstrous with that, so it was awesome. You do the Warp Tour because it's, it's, there's so much camaraderie. You know, and every day we get to park next to, I don't know, Bad Religion or Bouncing Souls or Less Than Jake. It's flogging mall. It's super fun. Even though the Warp Tour was gaining more and more popularity each year, the mainstream's interest in punk rock was dwindling. Bands such as Green Day and The Offspring were selling less and less of each release, and the new alternative was dubbed New Metal, with bands such as Korn and Limp Bizkit now holding the reins. As new metal gained in popularity and with manufactured pop music, boy bands, and plastic pop princesses all sharing the spotlight, ska punk, an offshoot of punk rock, gained popularity with bands such as the Mighty Mighty Bostones, No Doubt, Sublime, and Goldfinger all having hits. But two things would happen at the end of the decade that would cement the importance of the 90s incarnation of punk rock and pave the way for the slew of breakout pop punk bands of the new millennium. It would also make the most arguably successful DIY movement in musical history. Okay, so so Blink started out as just like after schools, we'd be going around singing around, you know, singing about fucking dogs and girls and uh, and you know uh, homosexuals and like food and like all this crazy shit and. Um, Stuff that really made us laugh hysterically. And then next thing you know, people start coming to the shows. And uh, so we just kept the jokes up. And then we started getting worse and worse and worse. Tom DeLong, he comes in my office. I, this was the time I just got kind of uh, hired by uh, the um, promoter, Bill Silva. It was right around that time. And uh, he comes in, he's like, man, Rick, he's like, I love your punk shows, man. He's like, they're super rad. And, and he's like, will you manage us? And I'm like, yeah, you're called Blink, right? He's all, yeah. He's like, we, we draw like 200 in San Diego. I'm like, all right, cool, yeah, I'll manage you. I, I agreed to manage him sight unseen. I had no idea what was gonna happen, you know? I had no idea. When we were first starting off as Blink, Pennywise took us on tour countless times. We were worth no tickets whatsoever. It cost them money to take us out on tour. But they were friends of ours and they believed in our band and they supported us. They took us out and put us in front of a bunch of people. Our very first tour ever of Australia, Pennywise paid for us to go over there. Nobody knew us in Australia. We were a tiny little band from San Diego at that point. This is back in like 95. So I think Cheshire Cat had just come out. People in Australia didn't really know us and we get a chance to go and tour with Pennywise who were huge over there. You know? Bands like Blink, you know, we kind of took under our wing and, and took them on tour with us and Offspring, anybody. Anybody that we could help, you know, we were into, we into helping, and you know, a, a lot of the bands went up, wound, wound up being, you know, some of the biggest bands in the world. One of my favorite stories is Pennywise. We're in Europe, and Fletcher looks at Kevin Lyman and he goes, "You're going to put the link on next year's Warp Tour." And Kevin's like, "Oh, this is awkward." Kind of like right in front of me, he's like, "You could tell it is. This is awkward." And he didn't want to commit to it. And Fletcher goes, "He's all." And Fletcher's all getting starting to get drunk. He's all pulls a piece of paper. He's like, "You're going to sign this right now, and you're going to put Blink on next year's Warp Tour because they're going to be gigantic, and you're going to pay them 1,500 bucks a night, and I'm going to pay them 500 bucks a night out of my own pocket because I believe in these guys so much." And he forced Kevin to do it. <laughs> all right. Hi, Joe. Ben Zuman. He's filming a porno. He's filming. The one man porno. You mind, you guys move I just found a porno called Three Men and Another Man. So if I had taken that philosophy and went and said, all right, Blink, you got to go on the small stage because they're selling more records and they're bigger than you, 
would, I don't think Blink would have come back in 1999 and played for me when they were, so I'd sold 8 million records. Tom, show the Black Eyed Peas how we dance. In LA, K Rock was, you know, all about playing Damn It and then started playing Josie, but Damn It was really just became like a staple. And, um, and they were really like in Southern California, they had just really created this thing. And a lot of other places, you know, they toured the country a bunch of times, but it was a lot smaller. A lot, and um, I think just at the end of that cycle, you know, they'd sold about 600,000 records and it felt like they were on the verge. And, um, they went into the studio to make Anima. None of us ever thought that it would do what it did. I mean, we didn't even think, it, it wasn't that we didn't think it was possible, it was that the thought never even entered our head of what it was going to do. We were just writing songs that we loved and doing what we did. And, uh, you know, Dude Ranch had come out and it had gone gold in the U.S. And Damn It had been, uh, you know, a success at radio and we'd done a video for it. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. That's really cool. That's, that's awesome. And then we started writing our next record. But it wasn't in our head like, oh, that's going to happen again or we're going to beat that. We were just like, let's go in and write a record that we really love. And that, I remember writing that record happened very quickly. Everything felt real natural. You know, it was Travis, me and Tom in a studio in San Diego writing these songs and everything was just banging at that point. People love to ask those questions like, when did you know this was going to happen or when did you feel? You know, it's like they're never exact moments necessarily because you got to remember we're traveling, you know, touring. 13 months out of the year. You know, we're always gone, sleeping on floors, making it happen, so every little piece of good news comes in strides, you know, so it doesn't happen overnight. Well, it does to some people, but not for Blink, you know. We were a band for years and years before it happened. They were on tour with, uh, with us, supporting us in Europe, and at home here in the States, they were selling like 90,000 records a day or something, you know, it was crazy. And, you know, I was there, witnessing them getting these you know messages about their record sales at home and and you know kind of like I, I was saying things like what are you doing here go home <laughs> get out of here <laughs> you know you know why do you want to be on tour with lag wagon right now and i remember actually being at a show and and uh noodles from the offspring he comes up to me he's like congratulations oh, thanks man enema of the state just came out and he looks at me right in the eyes and he goes he's like you're next and i go you know well don't say that. Well, I hope. I'll be right. He's like, no, you're next. You know. And then right after that, we sold seven million some records or something of that album. And I, was, I always remember that one moment because I didn't believe him when he said it. You know. I remember standing on stage at a sold-out Madison Square Garden show and looking up and seeing the scoreboard in Madison Square Garden and, and having just this feeling come over me of, oh my God, I can't believe that we're playing a headlining show at Madison Square Garden and it's sold out. And how can you top that? Got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then one year my life completely changed and I couldn't go anywhere in, uh, in my private jets, limousines and buses. And we would, just, we would sit around and say dick jokes got us this far. That's what we used to say all day long. We used to go, how did dick jokes get us into a private jet? These are credit, you know, credit is deserved, so. Blink had a lot to do with a lot of things, you know, changed a lot of lives. After Blink came, there was just, I mean, we would, you know, you know, when you tour and stuff, you get thousands, of, tons of uh, people coming to you, listen to my record, check this out, you know. And every single record we got from every kid sounded just like Blink. And so, I mean, it was, it was revolutionary. It was, I mean, equally as revolutionary as, as Green Day when it hit, you know. I don't think they just didn't get the credit that, that came with, you know, selling 20 million records. You had Nirvana come in with the punk, attitude and just an edge, but it was grunge. You had Green Day come in, and then you had Sublime and No Doubt kind of in 96. And then Blink just, uh, you know, kind of kept the dream alive, I think, for pop punk and for, you know, punk rock for that matter. On the flip side, Green Day had been struggling to make the same impact that they had in 1994 with Dookie. A cultural phenomenon such as Dookie is a hard thing to do once in a career, let alone twice, as Green Day did. On May 14, 1998, the most successful television show in history, Seinfeld, was having its final episode after nine seasons. This was a big deal. 
When Jerry Seinfeld announced in December 1997 that they were canceling the show, it was on the front page of every major newspaper across the world and even made the cover of Time magazine. As the final episode of the show drew to an end, the track Good Riddance, Time of Your Life by Green Day was played. That single episode of Seinfeld was watched by 76 million viewers, which equated to 58% of all television viewers that night. I think, well, you know, what's interesting about Time of Your Life is that that was actually written for Dookie. That was around, that was written during the Dookie era, but it didn't fit on Dookie. But it did seem to fit on Nimrod. And so, again, I don't think it was anything conscious. We were just being honest about the, the, about what, uh, how the band was feeling. And I think Billy was, you know, willing to branch out more and experiment with other things. Um, Good Riddance or Time of Your Life was a song that, uh, at first, we were like, like I actually said to them, I think, I think we should put strings on this. And they were like, are you strings? And I said, I know, I know. It's like, you, it's a punk band, but we're with strings. And they were like, all right, well, you know, Beatles did it. You know, eventually you can't just stay in one box. I mean, it's really a credit to them as artists that they have such a wide array of things that they can do. I mean, there's nothing. They, they can play any kind of music. They can do anything. It was worth all the you know, I, I, I really think that, you know, Billy Joe Armstrong is, is probably the Lennon McCartney of, of this generation or of the, of the last generation. I mean, I think, I think he's such a prolific songwriter that, um, I mean, I think that's first and foremost. And then everything else and the history that he had, you know, growing up where he did and, 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 and how he brought his band up and being who he was, certainly didn't hurt but his songs i think were the most important thing and before they're probably the biggest punk rock band actually until their time so i mean you're always kind of looking at them seeing what they're doing but they're really cool and rebellious you know and they're fun and colorful they're like cartoon characters almost you know it's something unpredictable but in the end that's right i'm done thank you for coming uh everybody who's sitting in the theater go home now
passing beyond To all those who work with us too long Life is the most precious thing you can do While you were here, the fun was never ending Grunge was really big and... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. 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 That